So I'd like to introduce our panel and it consists of three expert individuals. Uh, Mr. Robert Van Zwieten, Senior Advisor at Convergence. Ms. Unju Park Minnick, Chief Advisor for Sustainable Finance at BDO Unibank. And Mr. Taro Rasana, Regional Investment Lead for the Mekong at GGGI. So Robert, I'd like to first start this discussion with you. Um, as I mentioned, you're a Senior Advisor at Convergence. And this is a global network for blended finance. So like us, actually Convergence also just published a report and your report is um, focused on the state of blended finance in 2021. And climate change is really uh, featured predominantly in this report. So just to kind of set out a background, can you start by providing us some of the examples of how you're seeing blended finance impact or mobilize investment in climate change mitigation and adaptation? Thank you, Deanne, and great to be here with you, and thank you for having me, and of course, congratulations to both ESCAP and GGGI for the uh, the launch of the report. We uh, we highly recommend uh, the reading of the report for the audience, and, and I certainly, on behalf of Convergence, appreciate all the support given to uh, to Blended Finance. Um, so in, in, in sum, I think the answer to your question is uh, blended finance is both very impactful and significant in terms of climate finance. But let me start with uh, the report you referenced. We just launched the State of Blended Finance 2021, so that covers uh, 2020, and it, it provides an important backdrop to, I think, this discussion. Um, the report draws on our historical deals database, about a decade worth of tracking of deals, about 680 blended finance transactions that have garnered about $160 billion in financing over those uh, 10 years. Um, but you know, the report uh, has sort of a reality check in it uh, because of the pandemic's devastating effect on economies of the developing countries, uh, including in Asia. Uh, as you know, the OECD has projected the, the annual uh, SDG funding gap uh, might well have increased from about two and a half trillion to about 4.2 trillion a year. And just on climate finance, we'd need anybody's guess, but I guess between one to, to two trillion a year, about 50 trillion over 30 years, uh, some people uh, speculate. And that's why this year's report focus on, focuses on achieving scale in the blended finance market. And with scale, we mean how to crowd in very significant volumes of private sector financing uh, toward the sustainable development goals. Now, there is a lot of uh, rhetoric, um, uh, certainly also in, in Glasgow, but 2020 has seen a pretty severe drop, unfortunately, in, in blended finance deals uh, around the world. We usually see a run rate, an average run rate of about $9 billion a year. In 2020, that halved to $4.5 billion. Uh, even though the transaction count sort of stayed level at the average run rate of 55 deals or thereabouts uh, per year. Um, there are all sorts of COVID-related reasons uh, to that. No need to go into this uh, now, and we'll see, uh, we think, a bounce back in 2021. But two important takeaways. One is that the, the pool of official development assistance essentially is stagnant and has been stagnant for many years at about $150 billion a year. Um, add to that the 50 billion that philanthropic foundations have to spend on concessional capital. We essentially have for the entire global blended finance market a, a $200 billion worth of concessional capital pool, uh, which we need to use as strategically and efficiently as we can. Uh, and we'd love to see it grow, but that, that hope has been in vain for many years now. So this is what we need to work with. And the second uh, takeaway is that as far as the billion, a billions to trillions agenda, we're clearly uh, way off. I, I would love to have made a, a different conclusion, but uh, there simply is no skill yet. Nine billion is nothing to sneeze at in a normal year, but it doesn't make for any billions to, to trillions. But on the upside, uh, and more specifically to your question, Deanne, um, energy as a sector does make up about 35% of all 2020 planet finance transactions. And if we sort of broaden out our prism to everything climate related uh, and 2018 to 2020, then we see that 50% of all blended finance transactions incorporate some type of climate 
uh, related elements, whether it's SDG 7 or 12 or, or 13. Uh, there's some great examples of that. Uh, these transactions have so far mobilized about $100 billion to date. Uh, Climate Investor One is a great example, uh, a three sort of sub fund consolation uh, a facility, if you will, uh, set up by FMO that just closed at about $850 million. And of course, we've also seen the press releases of the Climate Finance Partnership launched by BlackRock and the governments of France, Germany and Japan, which will probably close somewhere north of, of $500 million. And we know in the pipeline there's a lot more, about 50% of fundraising deals that we track are also related to, to climate finance. So good news, but a little bit of a, a sober backdrop of the uh, so the, the lower level and, and the failure so far uh, on our part collectively to get from billions to trillions. Thanks so much, Robert. And um, I think you provided a very good basis in highlighting kind of what the challenges are, but also the opportunities as well. And I want to move now to you, Taro. Um, several of the case studies um, from the report include GGGI's experience and um, particularly allowing for green finance options discussed in the report to really be clearly demonstrated in practice. So can you highlight for um, the audience the most impactful initiative that GGGI has supported? Um, essentially, how did you attract the financing? How was it mobilized? What was the impact? And based on your experience, what advice would you give to others who are aiming to undertake similar initiatives? Thank you. Thank you, Diana. <clears throat> uh, I cannot, of course, talk on behalf of our uh, global portfolio. My, my focus area is Mekong, Mekong region, five countries, and uh, especially, especially municipal solid-based management-related investments. And uh, uh, the report highlights uh, the work we did in Vietnam, and uh, maybe I emphasize a little bit on that and uh, sort of catalytic value of, of the investment case. Uh, every, every government partner the Mekong region uh, wants us to support them in a municipal solid waste management of plastic related problems. So that's clearly on the top of the agenda. <clears throat> but when it comes to a modernization cycle of uh, municipal solid waste, uh, I would say Thailand is moving towards of the right direction, but uh, very few countries uh, have had a first in line type of modern uh, based management plan investment yet done. And uh, this project in Vietnam, uh, it was critical because it is first in type, first in line type of uh, investment in an untested uh, regulatory environment. Uh, so so in, in that work, uh, <clears throat> we took a sort of premise of unlocking domestic capital, getting the domestic uh, equity partners, uh, domestic uh, banking partners into the transaction at early stage as possible. Uh, because uh, uh, developing finance uh, uh, can have that catalytical impact, but if they are not able to unlock the domestic banks to these transactions, we are really not going to see the scale. And uh, we are sort of estimating this investment was uh, roughly 60 million US dollars that only in Vietnam, the potential of modernizing uh, major landfills of the secondary cities, uh, we are talking about uh, 1.52 billion US dollar investment cycle. So it was a tiny piece of the puzzle. But it solves certain problems uh, because uh, from the city authorities' point of view, uh, the technology selection has been very problematic in many countries in Asia. There are competitive ideas. Uh, there are some solutions, especially when it comes to sort of a mechanical uh, treatment, uh, sorting type of technologies. And uh, that was sort of key element of the technology piece we wanted to support here. And uh, Sort of a positive, positive uh, remark uh, going forward is that uh, I think the counterparts in Vietnam have started to understand that MSW technology is sort of modular technology, the gradual progression. So the first uh, uh, in line type of investment, we see that uh, progression when we think about fifth, six, seven investment in a modern uh, municipal solid based facilities in Vietnam. I think we start to see a local innovation. We start to see a better integration of the components and, of course, better environmental value. So bring that understanding that uh, these issues are complex. Technologies are net, not yet 100% proven. So getting the first investment working, getting the local stakeholders involved, it's critical. So I, I actually 
often prefer this project that it's not a blended finance uh, engineering task that we accomplished. It's really partnership work. Bring the right type of parties involved at the early stage, then we can replicate it. So, so in terms of sort of replication of this model, we brought a similar type of model to Cambodia about two years ago, and uh, about the same time also to Laos. And uh, the positive news is that those two capital cities, uh, the projects are moving forward, and hopefully we can reach the financial closing next year. So, so I think this is uh, what I like to highlight today. So it's all about a partnership. It's not about financial engineering. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Taro. And actually, you uh, kind of set the ground for my next question, and I wanted to go back to Robert on this. Um, we know blended finance allows for curbing of risk, as you mentioned, Taro, but it's also about catalyzing investment um, that might not otherwise have been seen um, because of the perce perception of being too risky, particularly in energy projects, as you had mentioned. So, Robert, I wanted to go back to you um, and ask, can you share with us some examples of innovative blended finance vehicles or options that the public sector could consider or also the private sector for scaling up climate action? Absolutely, and of course the context again would be the uh, the state of blended finance uh, report, so the, the, the fount of a lot of data. Uh, we know that in terms of the, the public sector donors, and, and that in our in our realm would be both the development agencies and then the DFIs and multilateral development banks uh, through which the development agencies work indirectly. Um, those public sector donors together make up about 47% of all of the commitments to blended finance deals in the 2018 to 2020 uh, timeframe. So 47%, very significant. And in terms of providing concessional capital, it's an even more outsized proportion. 75% is being provided by those public sector donors. So there's a very important and an outsized role played by, by the public sector. Now, there, there are many ways, of course, to play a role in blended finance as a, a public uh, donor. Uh, we see some concessional capital, some technical assistance, obviously, but but the biggest focus areas have been um, guarantees, a risk insurance, uh, particularly MIGA, the World Bank, and CEDA and USAID have been very active in that part, and that role is important because the DFIs and MDBs rarely provide guarantees, so there's a bit of a scarcity of that instrument. Uh, they provide it. And then typically public donors uh, move uh, quite, a, quite a bit in the area of design stage grants. And that is so congruent with the highest capital mobilization potential uh, guarantees. First, because of their relative scarcity in, in the marketplace, as I mentioned. Uh, second, uh, the grant making. We ourselves uh, at Convergence have been in the grant making business for a number of years in climate, gender and nature based solutions. We have supported out of several windows 24 solutions. We've done grant making to the tune of about 7.4 million, and all that has mobilized more than a billion dollars of capital. So that's a 135 times multiplier. So the, the capital mobilization potential is, uh, is very significant. We also see the donors feature in, in generally larger transactions, uh, larger than $100 million, many of which have a climate uh, focus. Uh, there's a lot of investing in funds going on, not surprisingly, because it's a, a well-templated type of blended finance uh, conduit. Um, and very often uh, transactions with donors tend to have multiple types of uh, concessional finance and obviously a stronger focus on uh, low income countries, which is which is hardly a, a surprise. Um, I'll, I'll keep my answer short, but I did want to refer to again the state of blended finance 2021. It's got about six uh, very, I think, well thought out recommendations, case studies and contributions from public sector donors. And so if you wanted to know more about how we would recommend that public sector donors initiate or perhaps expand their activity in blended finance. I think these will be very important recommendations to uh, to go by. Thank you. Thanks very much, Robert. Feel free to put that in the chat too, so our participants can have access to the report. I very much agree with you on the guarantee um, as being a good option, and it really I think provides a market-based solution, but also that curbing of risk element that's needed. Um, I wanted to move over now to Unju. Um, another green financing option highlighted in the publication is the focus on green and thematic bonds. 
And at BDO, you led the issuance of the first green bond to be issued in the ASEAN region, and it was in the amount of $150 million. That was in 2017. So can you tell us the impact that the bond has had in attracting financing for green solutions in the Philippines? What challenges you face maybe in the issuance of the bond? And also, you know, now we're in 2021. How has the market changed in the last um, few years? And what are you seeing that shift look like? Okay, first of all, congratulations on the publication in partnership with the UNS Cup and the GGGI. And then glad to be here to share the BDO's experience in green uh, finance space. Okay, BDO Green Bond issuance was a landmark transaction in 2017. It was the first green bond in the banking industry in Southeast Asia Pacific region. The use of proceeds allocated to seven renewable energy projects with installed capacity of 95 megawatt of varied technology. Uh, through this issuance, the avoidance of carbon emission uh, was 270,000 tons per year. So in addition to direct impact of the proceed, it influenced the systematic bond market of the Philippines and ASEAN region. The BDO uh, issuance accelerated the way for the regulator as well to issue green bond standard that follow the green bond principles of the ASEAN Capital Markets Forum. So after that, seven, seven Philippine banks issued green, social, and sustainability bond totaling 2.5 billion US dollar. So Philippines, including banking and other sectors, real estate, water distribution, and energy developers composed of 45% of the ASEAN labeled GSS bond as of February 2021. Uh, for the challenges, to issue green bond itself was a challenge in 2017, as a green bond instrument was very new and unfamiliar financial instrument at that time. In addition, there is no incentive or subsidy for issuing such a thematic bond, not like a Singapore, Malaysia market, where there are incentives to issue and list the green bond in public market. So it was pure. Uh, voluntary to issue the green bond as a corporate strategy pursues what the best practice is in sustainability. Uh, however, these challenges indeed turn to opportunity, which made the market gain awareness on benefits of green bond and video enhanced uh, brand reputation in green financing space. Video has practiced a sustainable finance journey since 2010. It is already decayed practice. However, since 2019, the green finance market becomes mature in terms of awareness as ever. I believe that the changes will happen more exponentially. So since 2018, seven local banks issued respective thematic bonds. It has gained traction influencing actually various stakeholders such as the banking industry itself, investors, regulators, and our clients, and MDBs, and even CSO. Last two years, local banks established the respective green social sustainability finance framework, and Central Bank of the Philippines issued a sustainable finance circular, which actually emphasized emphasizes the climate and ENS risk integration to bank credit system and obligates the board level to engage to sustainability strategies. And customers have reached out to the bank to inquire and be interested in having their project become part of a thematic bond proceed. So overall, the impact was enormous to all uh, whole market and all stakeholders. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And I think it's interesting how you showcased how just one issuance has led to really a market shift in the Philippines, particularly attracting investor, investors in, but also on the policy side as well, resulting in circulars. This is sometimes what we see is that sometimes the private sector is the first mover and then we have policies that follow. So this is a very good example. I want to go back to Taro now as well. And, um, you know, we're still in the very beginning of the COP. So 
Um, we might be speculating here, but I'd like to know what the main technical green financing instruments emerging from COP26 um, that could help to remove some of the existing challenges to climate finance and unlock some of the growing private sector demand for green and climate finance. So Tara, if you can provide us some examples of that, but particularly how do you think ITMOs or the increase in um, green climate in the green climate funds commitments um, could support the development of climate finance in Asia? And what are the expected implications in um, practice and how do you, um, how are the um, project uh, developers accessing these funds? Thank you. So maybe, maybe I take that project developer angle to answer that because of course the issue is still underlying and it's complex. Uh, uh, Lasse raised that his uh, opening remarks already that there's a bit of a mismatch. And uh, uh, also, also if you go back, uh, we go to Kyoto, Kyoto era, some of those lessons learned at that time. And uh, if you think about sort of SME mid market, uh, project developer, project owner in the waste management sector in Mekong, what are the problems of his project of not getting funding uh, at the moment? Typically, these uh, mid-market companies, they don't have big balance sheets. So when they go to the house bank, high level of collaterals are, are typically asked. So there is no capability of domestic banks to provide non recourse based uh, lending. And uh, that sort of prevents uh, some of these SME mid-market developers to really move ahead. And often we see that these mid-market developers, they're the creative ones. They, they have created uh, joint venture models. They're bringing new technologies. So they are really pushing the envelope in the market. Of course, we hope to see the big companies to do the same as well. So, so they, they, we are hopeful that, that there would be more support for sort of non recourse based lending if it would come through the Green Climate Fund uh, commitments. Uh, we see also positive uh, movement on a number of uh, domestic banks and uh, domestic government agencies uh, to, uh, have been accredited by Green Climate Fund recently. And uh, that's part of our work. We are currently either accredited or working on accreditation of 16 different. Uh, uh, domestic entities and really are supporting that work going forward. Then, then the second second part uh, of innovation, looking forward, of course, carbon credits, uh, bankability of the credits and lessons learned in Kyoto era. Uh, during the Kyoto era, when when a project developer again went to the went to his house bank, had that beautiful cash flow of carbon credits, bank said, no, those cash flows are not bankable. So, so clearly there, there, there was a barrier to access at CAPEX level funding of using those cash flows. And uh, there are no immediate solutions yet available for that, but uh, I would encourage us to have a bit of a discussion uh, today. And then of course, after this uh, session as well, that how to create, what are the optional strategies to sort of package those future cash flows? At the same time, understanding that already now, uh, the landscape is quite complex. And we don't want to see any sort of over designed uh, financial structures that nobody had access to. So, so there are a number of issues still open and uh, this was just sort of open for colleagues to start to discuss more in detail. Thank you. Thanks, Taro. And I want to give the last word to our private sector panelist here, Unju. So BDO has been really a first mover in the region in the green finance space in many ways. And I'm interested to hear what are BDO's plans in the future? Are there, and also, are there any um, innovative green financing options that maybe we may have missed in the publication that you'd like to highlight? Okay. Uh, from uh, For this, I will take a little bit a top-down approach first. Uh, okay. So role of financial institution, a financial institution always play a vital role to support the green finance. But this time, uh, their roles to achieve net zero. We are talking about uh, nowadays all the time net zero. Net zero by 2050 becomes more important than ever. So especially uh, as everybody aware, so catalyzing and mobilizing the private sector capital is very critical. Uh, since uh, 130 trillion US dollar is pledged yesterday, which is 40% of total assets in the book by financial institution, uh, green financing access provide actually wider window than the past. But the homework is how efficiently financial institutions 
deploy to right end users without much losses. How those funds can provide low cost of capital to developing countries. Financial institutions continuously find innovative ways to finance or invest to transit to net zero economy for that. So I hope BDO can be a member of uh, this time's Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero in very near future. And BDO's perspective, so banks have fiduciary duty to practice actually responsible financing, which also aligns to sustainable finance. It's very important to encourage and guide the bank's borrowing clients to operate their business in sustainable manners. Banks should provide the clients to develop their project to be sustainable because sustainable project becomes bankable project at the end. BDO as a prime mover in green finance in the Philippines has always been open to innovative sustainable financial product and an innovative business model. Started from the green bond issuance to support the renewable energy project, now BDO plans to issue expanded thematic bonds that cover not only green energy project, but also various sectors that would have a substantial environmental and social impact in society and also transit to low carbon economy. Uh, BDO makes sure that no one is left behind in its financial value chain for sustainability. Okay, regarding publication, uh, green financing option mentioned in the publication are well covered. The thematic bond, MDBs facility, and uh, carbon offset market mechanism, and national green vehicles, such as like establishment of green bank for national level or sub-national level. Green bond market increases drastically last few years with the continuous innovation. The level of awareness is very high now. Therefore, publication can cover more in other symmetric bonds, such as blue bond and sustainability linked bond alone. Countries such as Philippines and Indonesia, where countries are composed of southern islands, have a high potential to issue the blue bond to reduce the water footprint. Sustainability linked bond or loans enhances actually corporations overall sustainability in their business operation and importantly support carbon intensive sectors to transit to low carbon economy. Since transition bond has broader coverage for whole industries to transit to low carbon economy and it helps climate change culprit industry to transit to greener transition finance can be more discussed in next publication. As well, most large banks in the region have a relatively high loan exposure to carbon intensive sector, which was an engine for the region's economic growth last few decades. So it's important to bring those sectors to the table and find a way to help to transit to green. For innovative financial structure to shorten the coal power plant project life, there is a, some movement in cooperation with MDBs, coal power asset owners, and venture capital and local banks, which finance coal power project phase out earlier than project lifespan. This type of innovative financial structure needs the blended finance to lower the cost of capital to materialize the project in the developing country. Other recommendation can be a, an export credit export credit agencies role to support to green finance to developing countries. In the past, uh, based on my experience, in the past ECAs have financed coal power plant in the Southeast Asia region. ECAs are also introducing green facilities to support green finance with untied condition gradually, so that uh, ECAs role can be important to support green finance in developing country as well. Blended finance is a good tool for catalytic finance. Now renewable energy price become competitive compared to coal power price. So this can further support greenfield business model to secure the risk such as a solar merchant project, ESCO, battery energy storage system and other emerging technologies for carbon intensive sector to transit to low carbon economy. Yeah, thank you. 
Thanks very much, Enju. And I think uh, you highlighted some really important points there on the need for transitional finance, also the ability to phase out projects before their lifetime, uh, particularly such as coal powered um, fire plants, um, power plants, um, and then the need for catalytic capital and blended finance, which we've really discussed a lot here today. Um, I do want to make sure that the chat is open. I think it might be closed. So if we can make sure that that chat is open, that would be great. We did have some questions actually coming in um, before through the um, registration link, and I will go to a few of those um, now. And actually, I'm going to go to you, Patrick, first, um, even though you're not on the panel. I think this is an interesting question that came in because uh, it was actually a debate that Patrick and I were having when we started working on this study. And the question is from a university professor. His name is Sanjeet. Um, he said, do we even have we even defined green finance and climate finance in its true sense yet? So it's a very basic question, but I think it's important. Yeah, thanks, Deanna. Obviously, um, this question of classification and taxonomy within that green and climate space for the for for the for the report, essentially, we we took the very simple sort of classification of essentially, you know, climate. Um, when we talk climate finance, we're talking activities that focus on either mitigation or adaptation of cli climate. Um, and then when we're speaking green, we're taking a broader view, which encompasses uh, climate mitigation, climate adaptation, and more broadly, other environmental um, activities and projects. But, but I think it's a fair question, and what we're seeing is, you know, a lot of discussion around taxonomy and classification. Um, and that, and there, there's still, um, you know, nuance and detail to be worked out. But I think what we're we're seeing is gradually more agreement around the space, as uh, particularly around taxonomies and increasingly harmonisation um, in different in, in different regions and different countries around these definitions. So I think we're getting closer, although there's still um, there's still debate. There's still a bit of nuance um, to be had. So. I think we're getting closer, but but you know that's the nature that's the nature of these things that there is debate. Um, yeah, thank you. Great, Robert, over to you. Yeah, the uh, the question resonates with me. Uh, let me just uh, try and get yeah, I got rid of the hand um, because I I think there is a sort of a philosophical undertone to it. For a long time, uh, I think many people in the development finance community thought of climate finance as investing in clean and renewable energy, and we've just come to the realization that it actually may also include uh, energy transition finance, which is what uh, Unju uh, referred to. Uh, ADB has just launched yesterday at COP26 the uh, energy transition mechanism. Uh, Japan, the government of Japan, has given it a $25 million grant. Um, and what we realize is that this is not just about investing in clean assets, it's also taking out dirty assets much earlier uh, than business as usual, uh, which uh, perhaps might be a bit controversial and might not be so easy to find institutional investor money into. There's a clear role for blended finance into it. But you know, as we go on uh, and we figure out sort of the, the multiple variables of taking out the dirty, putting in more clean, but also making sure that we've got base load uh, supplied on a continuous basis against the backdrop of quickly growing economies, uh, I think we find that climate finance perhaps, perhaps has further meaning than we ever imagined. Thanks, Robert. Any of the other panelists want to address that? Otherwise, I have another question that's actually come in as well. Lasse. Yeah, I, I would just uh, like to maybe make a plea for the role of governments in defining what is green. We do see lots of private sector or, or many private sector initiatives, and, and it's good that the, there is experimentation and different um, different approaches are being taken such that we get experience and we can pick the best approach. But at some point, I believe governments need to step in and define what is green and what is not green. Uh, we do see, I say this because we, we see that investors are confused and to some extent sitting on the fence, not wanting to invest in assets if it turns out later on that they are not green. 
and then they would be accused of picking projects just for the sake of it and not investing in green. So, uh, and this I think is particularly an issue for smaller investors. If they need to undertake research on their own, uh, which are going to be costly and it's going to take up time, it would slow down the market. It's a little bit outside what we are discussing now, but I, I, I do think that governments, they have a role in this area and uh, it's not an easy one. But um, one could maybe see a parallel to this in the voluntary and the, and the mandatory carbon market, two very different things. Where So if you are using climate or projects for compliance issues, governments uh, need to be comfortable with what projects are considered eligible and which ones are not. So just that issue, uh, just a point about the role of government and not just leave it to the private sector. Thank you, Lasse. I think that's a very well uh, uh, put point. One other question that just came in, um, and then we'll actually go to the one in the chat here too, was last night's Glasgow Financial um, Alliance for Net Zero um, announced 130 trillion of assets that might impact green. How do you see this um, this 130 trillion impacting green and climate finance um, access in this region? So any um, takers for that question? That's a that's a big one. <laughs> uh, okay. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, basically, the based on the. Uh, uh, as a the green finance practitioner in the frontier frontier line, uh, not not that pledge yesterday. Even before there are climate finance, there are a lot of uh, uh, potential climate finance for the developing country. But always there is a challenges. Always there is the deployment problem here. Mm -hmm. So the the the. Patrick, Patrick mentioned about the like currency mismatch, all these things. Yesterday, I also attended some webinar about the Green Bank facility mm -hmm. network, and then also they talk about the, this this type of uh, challenges. So I think uh, to provide the, such a huge amount of pledge, but I think real homework is how to deploy to the local market. I mentioned already, right end user without loss. That is, I think, really uh, good homework. So, sort of also yesterday, th there is a discussion about uh, looks like a very broad, wide, but there is a no in-depth discussion in uh, the, about the, the financial pledge yesterday. So, I think that homework is really brings us some innovative way. So, uh, in 2017, Green Bond was innovative to us. Why? Because our Philippines has actually regulation, BSP regulation. So, for example, bilateral facility cannot reach, we cannot disperse to the end users. But the green bond, actually, there is a no restriction to disperse to the end users. That's mm -hmm. why green bond we consider as an innovative way. So after that, I mean, the, the, the green bond market uh, drastically actually uh, grows. So. Uh, that kind of something out of the box thinking, something bring innovative ways. That is, I think, uh, uh, to solve the 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 disperse the, this huge uh, climate finance over there. So we always say that there is in the cloud so many funds there, but we cannot reach. So I think the homework is really bring it there, and then how do we uh, the 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 structure to disperse to really end user local users. So yeah. I think this is a really good point and it actually leads to Andrew's um, question here in the chat. He says cities play a critical role in achieving NDCs. What advice do you have for cities to access green um, climate finance? Um, we are limited on time, so I'll ask you guys to keep your, your answers short on this so that we can go to the closing. But I think this is the critical um, challenge is how to access these funds. Robert or Anju or Taro? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, I'll be happy to Go be the first taker, but I'll, I'll have a very quick answer. I think there are incredible applications for clean and renewable energy in an urban setting, uh, waste to energy, uh, as uh, Patrick uh, uh, took us through the example, uh, solar rooftop, uh, smart grid technology, uh, energy efficiency, 
all that needs financial capital. I think here is where the report comes in with the recommendation to consider uh, a national financing vehicle. Uh, there's no uh, reason to not bring that down to a city level and become the master of your own destiny. Great response. Onja, do you want to um, also take that up? Uh, this actually, the private sector uh, has a challenge to have risk appetite of this type of actually the, the project. So in this case, actually, we need really access. Private sector itself need access, not only the project de development uh, proponent, uh, private uh, sector, the financial institution need access to have the blend, blend finance, blended finance. And then we can actually participate to all these type of like uh, sort of uh, not not I mean that there's no risk appetite yet but maybe we can jump in there great and Taro last word from you <clears throat> yes indeed a municipal solid base uh, that's a secondary city city level problem a risk uh, profile you see about uh, five years ago when we talked with the development finance investors uh, we said that we have a bioenergy project in, in uh, Vietnam or Thailand. Uh, and after they heard that it's municipal solid waste, they said, unfortunately, we cannot bring it forward. This has changed. Uh, actually, at GGGI, about uh, three years ago, we asked the seven development finance institutions had a round of calls. All of them said that their top management has uh, sort of uh, ask the uh, investment managers to look municipal solid waste to energy opportunities in East Asia. So that was a really positive message that DFIs are sort of moving towards of that risk, uh, being the first frontier. So some positivity here. Thank you. Great. Last day, last word. <laughs> oh, you're on mute. Very quickly, when you bring up the issue of cities, uh, sometimes the view is like inward and you look at the opportunities within the cities. I, I think it's also across cities. So do similar type of projects across a number of cities can be much more efficient than actually trying to aggregate within cities. Of course, the two models can be can be combined. But we see some of the most efficient ESCOs in, in South Asia. They're doing exactly that. So they do cooling or they do LED lights or they do street lights and they're very, very specialized in that area that they can go and buy the, the from the manufacturers at bulk and get the prices down instead of trying to fit sectors that are very difficult to fit in. But in, 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 from an administrative point of view, they are all part of the same city, but they can be difficult to match uh, apples and pears. Very important point. Thank you, Lasse. And I want to thank all of the panelists for this excellent discussion. I think we've dived into a lot of different issues here um, and I think what we're hearing is blended finance is very much needed and um, particularly in order to access funds as well. Um, my colleague Sophie will be posting a survey in the chat so please do uh, click on that um, and, and provide us your feedback on this event and I'm very pleased now to um, introduce Mr. Alberto Iscut. He's the Acting Chief of the Financing for Development section at SCAP for the closing remarks. Alberto, over to you. Thank you very much, Liana. Uh, dear colleagues, distinguished participants, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you from Bangkok. To start with, I would like to thank the presenters, moderator, and panelists for a very engaging discussion today. An important takeaway of this conversation, at least for me, is the growing role of the private, uh, private finance as a source of development finance. Now, be it blended finance or you know, innovative uh, instruments like green bonds, that it is clearly that this market is, is growing very fast and there are more and more opportunities for developing countries to, to find the finance that they need uh, to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and, climate, and the climate goals. Um, going forward, how can we build uh, on the publication we have presented in this event to drive the partnership between ESCAP and GGGI in action, into action? What complementarities we can take advantage of and what is the particular contribution that ESCAP can bring to the table? To answer this question, I would like to mention two examples of ESCAP's current work on innovative financing. 
The first one is an ongoing technical assistance project with National Bank of Cambodia to support the development of Cambodia's green finance strategy. This strategy will likely lead to the adoption by Cambodia of inno innovative financing instruments such as green bonds, and such adoption will need to be complemented with the mobilization of green investments, the implementation of green growth projects, and the development of local capacities and knowledge sharing. And all of these are core areas of expertise of GGGI. So I can see basically the ESCAP you know, can support the process, working with regulators, with policymakers, trying to create appropriate frameworks. And GGA, GGGI has a lot of presence on the ground, so it can actually complement this work. And of course, the third leg of the table will be, of course, the financial sector, right? We need, we need the financing. But all these elements, you know, the, the generation of good projects, having a proper uh, policy framework and regulations are all complementary. And so it's, I think I see great value in, in all of us working together. Um, as another example, ESCAP is currently preparing a feasibility study on debt for climate swaps in the Pacific small island developing states in cooperation with the Pacific Island Forum. And next March, ESCAP and the Pacific Island Forums will co-organize a regional debt conference, bringing together debtors and creditors, and debt for climate swaps will be one of the areas to be discussed. Similarly to the case of green bonds, the implementation of debt for climate swaps will need a pipeline of effective climate mitigation and adaptation projects and an effective implementation of such projects, for which the partnership with GGGI will also be very, very valuable. In closing, I would like to thank the participants for taking time to join this event during an extremely busy time uh, during COP26. I wish you all a pleasant rest of the day and a fruitful experience during the rest of COP26. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great evening and day, everyone. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.